you have your Bibles, you can grab them quickly. Flip to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. from that day Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 this is what it says now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not yet seen it's the evidence of things not yet seen see we must believe before we'll see that, that's, that's the mandate on our lives as Christians we've got to believe before we'll see. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that you came and gave your life for us. We thank you that you came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, but to fulfill it so that we could fulfill the law through you. We thank you for that today. We thank you that you gave your life as a living sacrifice so that now we have the ability to be made right with our heavenly Father, with our creator. And Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would touch our hearts, touch our minds, Lord. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying today. And I pray, Lord, I would decrease so that, Holy Spirit, you would increase. Jesus, I need your anointing to help me preach your word today. I pray you would take over, Lord, and let your anointing go forth because it's your anointing that breaks every yoke, that breaks every stronghold. Holy Spirit, reveal to us your word, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Before you're seated, tell your neighbor, say, get ready to get risky. Not frisky, but get ready to get risky and check out the video. So, so look, at the beginning of the year, right, the Lord gave us a specific word because I asked for one, right? I said, Lord, we, we as a church, we, we need a word. We we need you to give us as a body a word, a word that we can hold on to, a word that will stabilize us when this world tries to shake us and knock us off what you're requiring of us. Because how many of you realize this? This world has a tendency of trying to beat us up, knock us down, and shake us all around, right? It does. And so, man, I didn't want a general Lized word. I wanted a specific word, what God was speaking for us in 2022. And so the Lord was faithful to give that word. And the word was faith. Come on, someone shout faith. faith. It was faith. And what the Holy Spirit was saying when he gave us that word is simply this. Pursue me for the type of faith that would lead you to believe me for anything. Pursue the type of faith that would lead you to believe me for anything. See, Jesus says in John chapter 14, truly, truly, I say to you, those who believe in me, those who put their full faith in me, who pursue me for, for, for faith, man, they'll do the works that I do and even greater works than these will they do because I'm going to be with the Father. Verse 14, he reminds us, he says, if you ask me for anything, someone shout anything. anything. If you ask me for anything, if you have faith in me for anything, if you ask for it in my name, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. Ephesians chapter three, verse 20, the apostle Paul says it this way. Now to him, talking about Jesus, now to him, who will do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever ask, think, or imagine according to the power at work within us. According to the faith that's at work within us. See, listen to me. Our faith in Jesus will cause Jesus to do great things for us, in us, and through us. According to the power at work, within us. 
And so when the Holy Spirit gave us the word faith, what he was very simply saying was, this year, I wanna take you from faith to faith. That's what I wanna do. I I wanna grow your faith so that you can believe me for anything. What the Holy Spirit was saying is, is I need you to pursue me for for the type of faith that I know you need in order to get you to where I want you to be. Not where you wanna be, but where I need you to be. And, and man, I tell you, um, he was right. <laughs> he was right b- because this year has been a year that's just been a faith journey, a complete faith journey. And this is why God said it. See, see God is asking us to do things this year that could not have or would not have been able to happen without a greater measure of faith. I'm just telling you. Without a greater measure of faith, there is no way possible that we would have ever even thought to start a private Christian school. <laughs> like, like there's no possible way. And I want you to think about this just for a second. Like we had no idea where we would have it. We had no idea who would teach at it. We had no idea who would lead it. We had no idea where the money would come from to support it. We, we, we didn't know any of that. All we knew was is that God said do it. That's all we knew. And because faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God, when we heard the word of God, all we were required to do was do it. And then he would increase, increase our faith for it. See, we didn't need to know exactly where we would do it. We didn't need to know exactly who would teach at it. We didn't need to know exactly who would lead it. We, we didn't need to know exactly who would even support it. All we needed to do was just do it because God said it. That's it. And so this entire year has been a a faith journey and it isn't over yet. (laughs) Matter of fact, it's just the beginning. Praise the Lord. Praise God. But see, God is so faithful to us that he was preparing us for the journey ahead of us. And so he gave us a word, this word, faith. A specific word for this specific body. And so last week we launched back into another series titled faith. And we started off this, this series by talking about what cancels faith. And I think this is so important for us to know, because I think a lot of us think that things like fear and unbelief and sin cancel faith. Now, like I said last week, those things are obstacles to faith for sure, but those things won't cancel faith. Matter of fact, God will use those things And every other obstacle we face to increase our faith. That's what he'll do with those things. But see, there's there's one thing that he cannot use. There's one thing that he refuses to use. There's one thing that will completely shut faith down. And that thing is pride. Pride will cancel faith every single time. It will completely wreck faith. Faith, why? Because pride makes it all about I, 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 I. I, what I want, what I dream, what I desire, what, what, what's going on in my heart. It's about I, I, I. When this life is supposed to be all about him, him, him. What he dreams, what he wants, what he desires. But pride makes it all about I. See, pride will make us think we can do it without God. But we can handle this on our own, God. We got pride in that, is- in that area. We need to take that before the Lord. Pride will will cause us to do things we were never supposed to do in the first place. Hear me. Never supposed to do it, but yet we're doing it because pride has come into our life. Pride will cause us to think that God blesses us no matter what we do. Like I'm telling you, no matter what we do, God will bless us, but that's just not true. See, listen to me, church. God has a will. God has a plan. And see, what pride will do, it will cause us to think that Our will and our plan is his will and his plan, which is a very dangerous place for us to end up in. I'll tell you, pride's a beast. Proverbs chapter 16 says it this way. Pride comes before the fall and a haughty spirit comes before destruction. Pride has taken out so many incredible men and women of God over the the years. You know, I found a story this week I actually found it last Sunday, um, but I didn't, 
I didn't put it in the, in the sermon. I wish I would have, but it was literally right before I came out, um, out here to preach. And so I'm not quite that good to just throw it in at the last minute. But, but King Uzziah, 2 Chronicles chapter 26 is an incredible story about pride. This man was an incredible man of God almost his entire life, displayed incredible faith throughout his entire life. And because of that, God prospered him and his kingdom. But starting in verse 16, the Bible says this, but when he became strong, he grew proud and it was to his destruction. So when pride, when he became proud, when pride entered his heart, it was to his destruction. It canceled his faith. His pride caused him to do things he was never called to do in the first place. And man, I encourage you to go home and read that for yourself. Second Chronicles chapter 26, because man, it, it impacted my life. I was like, man, Lord, man, Lord, because listen to me, pride is such a devastating thing. And here's why it's so devastating as well, because we can't see pride in ourselves. Remember what I said last week, pride is like bad breath. You don't know you have it, but everyone else around you knows you have it. Like, and it's so true. And because of, because of that, we've got to have people around us who can put us in check, who can check us where we are in our lives. Because if we don't, if we've got no one around us that can hold us accountable, we will definitely fall into pride. For sure, it's a guarantee. And if we do, then man, God will be forced to humble us. And did you know Hebrews chapter 10 says this? It is a scary thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a scary thing. In other words, we don't want God to have to humble us. We, we want those around us to tell us and then us repent and turn from it and not make God, God do it. See, see pride's a, a sin that will separate us from him because pride will cancel, will cancel faith. The Bible says that pride is an abomination to God, that God will resist the proud, but he will exalt the humble. And so we started off this series, this new faith series, talking about what cancels faith so that we know what to guard ourselves against to make sure, man, we don't allow pride to enter our heart. And when it does, we turn, repent, and turn from it as quick as possible, as quick as possible, which leads us to today's message. And the title of today's message is this, a risky faith, a risky faith. See, Hebrews chapter 11, verse one says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, but it's the evidence of things not yet seen. It hasn't been seen. And listen to me, if you can't see it, it's risky. It's risky. Faith is risky because we can't see the outcome. We have no idea how things are gonna end up. We just don't. Now we can read it, but we can't see it, how it's gonna end up. See, see, risk is taking a chance on something, even though we're not sure of how that something is going to turn out. We don't know. And so we take a risk on it. We bet on it. Now, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds a lot like faith to me. It sounds like a lot like faith to me. And remember the definition that we gave last week with faith. Faith is believing something is so, even though it isn't so, so that it may become so simply because God said so. And remember, that's not my original definition. I'd like to take it, but it wasn't mine. I heard someone else say it somewhere and I adopted it, maybe stole it, but whatever. But Faith is believing something is so, even though it's not so, so that it will become so simply because God said so. See, faith is simply believing that what God is saying is true. That's what it is. Faith is living and acting like God is telling us the truth. And so we bet on it. We risk everything on it. And it is risky. It's risky because it's us believing that God is saying the truth without us seeing that God is saying the truth. That's what faith is. And if you continue to read down Hebrews chapter 11, what you'll find is it's filled with names of men and women of God who had great faith. And the reason they had great faith was because God would say something to them. And the thing that he said to them didn't make any sense to them at the time that he said it to them, but they did it anyway. They obeyed him anyway, even though it made no sense to them. Let me give you a for instance. Hebrews chapter 11, 
starting in verse seven. This is what it says. It says, by faith, someone shout by faith. faith. Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen. It, It hasn't been seen and God tells Noah about it. He warns Noah about it. In reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So in other words, here God is, he tells Noah, hey, hey, listen, I'm about to do something and the something I'm about to do, no one's ever seen it before, let alone you, but no one's ever seen what I'm about to do. But I'm still requiring you to do the thing I'm telling you to do, even though you can't see what I'm about to do. And even though you've never seen what I'm about to do. In other words, what God is saying to Noah, I need you to take a risk. I need you to bet on me. I need you to take a risk on me. And most of us know the story of Noah and the ark, right? The thing that God was saying to him was, hey, I'm gonna flood the earth. And Noah, if you wanna save your family, your household, then you better build an ark to save you from the flood. Now, most theologians say that there had never been rain on the earth up to that point. At all, it never rained on the earth, that God watered the earth from the ground up, not from the heavens down. That's what the consensus is. Now, I wasn't there, so I'm not sure. But, But that means that no one had ever even seen rain, let alone seen a flood. And so Noah wouldn't have had a clue what God was talking about. He wouldn't have had a clue what any of this would look like. All he knew was he had to obey what God was saying. And because Noah lived and acted like God was telling him the truth, even though he couldn't see that God was telling the truth, the Bible says he was a man of great faith. He had great faith. Because Noah took a risk on God. And listen to me, he risked his reputation. He risked his social status. He risked his leadership equity on this. And because he risked everything he had built on what God said, the Bible says he displayed great faith in God. In verse eight of Hebrews chapter 11, it says says this, by faith, someone shout by faith. faith. Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He didn't have a clue what makes him the father of our faith because he didn't have a clue where he was going, but he still went anyway. God was saying, I'm gonna require you to risk everything to follow my word. In verse 11 of Hebrews 11, it says this, and by faith, someone shout by faith. faith. Even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, this is Abraham's wife, she couldn't have babies was able to bear children, was able to bear children, not even a child, but children, couldn't bear any kids up to this point, but was able to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made her the promise. See, see, we've got to believe before we will see. We must bet it all on God if we want God to show up for us. I'm telling you, we got to bet it all. We got to risk it all. We want to walk in the supernatural and see supernatural miracles take place amongst us. We got to risk it all to follow his word. We got to risk looking stupid and silly and everything that we've built on this life, in this life, we've got to risk it if we want to walk in the supernatural things of God. See, all these people, every single one of them all took great risks in order to follow what God said. They bet it all on God. I mean, Noah, Noah bet, built this ark, and everybody around him was making fun of him. Every single person was making fun of him. His family, his friends, the neighborhood, everybody was making fun of him. Abraham, he bet it all on God by leaving his family, by leaving his, his, his family for a place he didn't even know existed, by the way. He'd, he'd never been out of the place where he was. He didn't know where he was even going. God didn't even tell him where he's going, but he still bet it all. And I guarantee you, mom and dad was saying to him, boy, you're crazy. Like, what are you talking about? You can't leave here. This is where your roots are. This is your family. You're supposed to stay here and hold your family together. And God said, no, no, no. I want you to leave them and go to where I've called you to go. Abraham risked everything in order to follow God. Faith, faith is, 
It's risky. And you and I are to have a risky faith if we wanna walk by faith and not by sight. It's risky to do so. But, but do you know what I find is, is so true amongst most of us, if not all of us? See, a lot of us have no problem taking risks in this life. We don't. That's why we, we invest all this money into the stock market. That's a risk. I mean, we're risking that the stocks are gonna go up and not down. Right now, don't invest in there because they're going down. But I'm just saying. But it's a risk. We start businesses and we risk everything. We go into great debt. We do all this stuff to build what we, we believe we're supposed to build and all that and all that's fine. But we don't mind taking a risk on things in this, this life. But yet we have a hard time risking everything on God. A, a lot of us have no problem, right? no problem at all, betting on what other people say to us, but have a hard time betting on what God says to us. Like for instance, if, if someone would say to us, man, I've got an incredible job for you. But in order for you to have the job, you've got to uproot your whole family and you've got to move clear across the country. As long as the money's better and as long as the benefits are better, then man, we'll bet on what that person said and we'll take everything over to that place. But, but when God says take a job that pays less, that doesn't have as good as benefits, we won't bet on that. Even though God says that I will provide for all of your needs according to my riches and glory, not according to your ability, no, no, according to my riches and glory, but boy, we have a hard time betting on that word. Isn't it interesting on how many of us will take all these different risks in life, but won't risk anything to follow God's word? Isn't it interesting that we have a very hard time betting on what we know God has said we know God is saying something to us, but we'll have a hard time betting on it. But yet we'll bet everything on what someone else says to us. Isn't it interesting? See, see the, the word of God is filled with people, with people who were willing to bet it all on God, even though they weren't certain of the outcomes that was about to take place. They had no idea. You know, I'm reminded of the three Hebrew boys that most of us know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Now, now, these three boys were about to be thrown into a fiery furnace and burnt alive, not killed, then burnt. No, no, burnt alive if they didn't bow down and worship this golden image set up by King Nebuchadnezzar. But I love their response to King Nebuchadnezzar as, he, as these three boys, these young boys stood before the king. They made this statement, we don't owe you or anyone else an explanation. We don't have to defend ourselves to you on this matter. We don't have to. Because even if we're thrown into that fiery furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us and he will deliver us, but even if he doesn't. I love that. Even if he, he will and he can, but even if he doesn't, I want you to know and everyone else to know the God I serve. And I will not bow my knee to this golden image or to any other God that you try to put before me. He's able to deliver us, but even if he does, they were not certain of the outcome, but they bet their entire life on the word of the Lord. Because God says, don't bow before any other God. Don't worship any other God before me. Love me with your whole heart and your whole mind. And these three boys says, I'll bet it all on that. I'll bet our very lives. Another example for us is found in the book of Esther, and it's, it's Esther. Here Esther is, right? I preached on this a few months ago, but here Esther is, she, she's put in this very difficult situation, very difficult. But yet she, she makes this statement. She says, I will go and petition the king on behalf of the people of Israel. And if I perish doing it, well, then I perish. In other words, I'm not sure of the outcome, but because I know God is telling me I gotta go petition the king, I'll do it anyway. I'll risk it all in order to follow his word. I'll risk everything for God. And she had no idea of how things was going to end up. See, the question that we're faced with today and every other day from this point forward is this. Will we bet on God? Do we have a risky faith? Would we risk it all in order to follow his word. Would we 
or wouldn't we? Are, are we willing to risk everything to show him that we only want him? You know, Matthew chapter 14, you guys with me? Everybody good? Yeah. Matthew chapter 14, what we find is Jesus, okay? And Jesus is healing all these different people. He performs one of his craziest miracles to date, which was he fed over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two small fish. He broke it, multiplied it, fed the masses. And then after they were done, they collected 12 baskets of leftovers. Like absolutely amazing. The Bible says, but immediately after that took place, Jesus gave his disciples a word. And that word was this, get into the boat and cross to the other side. That was the word, get in the boat and I want you to cross to the other side. And the Bible says, while they were doing that, Jesus went up to pray by himself on a mountainside. And while Jesus is praying, the disciples were supposed to be crossing the sea to the other side. But the Bible says that the wind was blowing against them, that the storm was raging against them, trying to stop them from fulfilling what God had called them to do. But you got to hand it to them. They didn't turn around. They, they, they kept on struggling. They kept on rowing. They kept on fighting. But, but, but something that we, we have to realize, we have to realize is this and picture this, that as they are rowing harder and harder, the wind keeps blowing harder and harder against them. They're rowing this way, but the wind is blowing them that way. So they're going nowhere fast. Absolutely nowhere fast. And this is what we have to, to, to realize. They are doing exactly what God said to do. They are smack dab in the middle of God's will. 100% following what God told them to follow but yet they are experiencing a ton of resistance. So much resistance, they can't go where God has called them to go. They can't do what God had called them to do. And what this tells us very simply is this. When God tells us to do something, when we have a word and we're willing to risk it all to follow that word, I promise you we'll experience a ton of resistance. All kinds of resistance. I mean, I'm telling you, I find, this to be, I find this to be the case in life, especially when it comes to launching the school. There's been so much resistance come against us. But do you know what God just keeps saying to us? Keep rowing, 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 rowing. Let that wind keep blowing, 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 because you know that I called you to do this. And because he said it, He's the one that will complete it. See, see, the Bible says, he who began a good work will see it to completion. So I'm just trusting God will complete it, no matter how hard the wind is blowing. So man, what we've got to realize is, is, is our responsibility is obey the voice of God. Not being persuaded by anyone or anything to do something other than God told us to do, period. We can't. And I tell you, in my personal life, I've seen the same thing play out so many times, I, I can't even, it's not even funny, actually. I can see it coming now from a mile, a mile away. God speaks something to do that something, try to go do that something. And I'm telling you, the wind starts blowing. The storm starts raging. The enemy will start using people, even people within the church to try to stop what God is telling, telling me to do. And the only reason why I say that to you is because I promise you, because it happens to me and it happens to the disciples, it'll happen to you. Listen, you're just doing your own thing. Yeah, you won't experience much resistance. It's true. But when you step out and start doing what God has called you to do and told you to do, I promise you, you'll have all kinds of resistance come against you. You'll have all kinds of people trying to persuade you to do something other than what God told you to do. Just do it a different way. People will try to stop you from doing what God is telling you to do. But, but hear me, hear me, and this is very important. If we don't do it the way God said do it, it's sin. Hear me. It is sin. We are now in sin. And it's not like we can say, well, you know, they're Christian. I'm Christian. We can kind of compromise it. No, 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 no. If God said it, you do it. Because if, you, if not, you're in sin. See, James makes it very clear. He says, for you who know what's right to do and you don't do it, for you it's sin. For you it's sin. See, we gotta just do what God is telling us to do and we gotta be willing to risk everything in order to to do it, everything. We gotta have a risky faith. We, we gotta be willing to bet our lives on the word of God. 
And, and, and hear me, listen, listen to me. When we place a bet on God, it's the best bet we can ever place. Don't get it confused with the easiest bet because God never promised it'd be easy. That's not the promise. Matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. He says, many trials will come against you. So, so it's not gonna be easy, but it will be the best bet you've ever, that you've ever made. We gotta place a bet on God, risk it all on God because it's the best bet we'll ever make. But here we have the disciples, right? They're trying to do what God told them to do. But the wind is blowing against them. They're, they're, they're facing all types of resistance, trying to stop them from doing what God had called them to do. The, the storm is raging all around them. But you know what else happens? Darkness falls on them. So now not only is the wind blowing, but now they can't even see where they're going. They, they, they can't even see. See, the scripture says this. Shortly before dawn, so it's dark, there is no light, it's completely dark around them. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. But immediately Jesus says this, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. So here we have these 12 grown men, grown men, tough men, scared to death, trying to do what God called them to do. Has the storm trying to kill them and stop them from doing what God called them to do and darkness is all around them and all of a sudden you see them screaming. They're terrified. They're super scared. But Jesus immediately says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And this is what Jesus is trying to reveal to us is that he will come after us. He is our very present help in times of trouble. Showing us that because he's for us, he'll never leave us nor forsake us, no matter what is coming against us. See, this, this tells us that when we find ourselves struggling, trying to fulfill the word that God has placed on our life, to try to fulfill the will that he's asked us to fulfill. And now we're experiencing all this tribulation and trial coming against us. He will come and encourage us. Not if we're out doing our own thing. Listen to me, God won't remove a storm if you're doing the wrong thing. He'll leave the storm there so that you turn around and come back to him. But if you're doing, because you know what God is telling you to do, and you continue to do that thing, but you start running into resistance, what this shows us is that Jesus will come after us and he'll encourage us by giving us another word. By giving us another word. Because his word brings life, hear me. His word is better than life, that's what the Bible says. And see, this is what he ultimately does for the disciples right here. He sees them struggling to fulfill the first word because remember the first word was, was what? Get into the boat, go to the other side. That was the word. Get into the boat, go to the other side. They do exactly that. But now they're experiencing all this resistance. And so then he comes to them again, walking on the water. And he says to them another word, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, which ultimately shows us this. He desires for us to make it. He desires for us to do what he is calling us to do. So he'll make sure that he sees us through if we take the risk, if we risk it all to follow him. Listen to me, listen to me. God didn't bring you this far in life just to leave you stranded now. He didn't, he didn't do that. God didn't give you a mission to fulfill on this earth just to allow you to fail the mission. Even though it may seem that way, that's not who he is. No, he's faithful to complete the work. And so he's saying, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. And man, I love Peter's response to what Jesus says. I love it. Because Peter says this, Lord, if it's you. So Jesus says, it is I. Peter says, well, Lord, if it's you, if it is, tell me to come to you on the water. And I love that. Because let me tell you what that's saying. Peter wasn't satisfied with a generalized word. He wanted a specific word. Jesus, I heard you, right? 
but I need a specific word. I heard you say to all of us, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. I heard that and that's great, but I need a word for me specifically. And Jesus responds to Peter is real, real easy. Come, come. And what that tells us is this, Jesus wants to give each of us our own word within the generalized word. See, he, he wants to tell all of us personally as individuals, come, come, follow me, come, seek me. But see, the question that remains is, is this, will we press into him for that specific word? Will we, will we ask him for that specific word in the midst of the generalized word? And listen to me, because Peter didn't settle for just a generalized word and he pressed in for a specific word, let me tell you something, he got to walk on water. He got to experience the supernatural things of God because he wasn't happy. He wasn't satisfied with just an ordinary word. No, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I I need need more. I need more from you. I need a word specifically from you to tell me what you want me to do right now in this moment. Jesus has come. He walks on the water. Guess what? None of the other disciples did. None of the rest, none of them did, but Peter was the only one. Peter received a greater revelation because he didn't settle for just a generalized word. See, I asked God at the beginning of the year, I said, God, we need a specific word. I know you got a bunch of words within your word, but God, what's the word you have for us? What is the word? And because God desires to give us a word, he was faithful to give us a word. And that word was faith, right? Faith, 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 faith. And we all received that word. It was a word for us as a corporate body, okay? But what we should have been doing is we should have been seeking him and asking him, Lord, 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 I heard you that faith is for the whole body, that you want to grow our faith corporately, but Lord, I want to know what you want to do to my faith personally. God, God, what, how do you, how do you want to grow my faith? How do you want to take me personally from faith to faith? I see the church doing these things and there's healings and there's deliverances and there's all these things. They got all these videos playing and all that's amazing, but God, what do you have for me specifically? how do you want to increase my faith so that my faith impacts my life and the lives of those around me, those closest to me. That's how we should be acting with these generalized words, just like this word today. Yeah, yeah, Lord, I heard you. I heard you. We're to risk it all to follow you. We're to, we're to, to, to give it all. We're to bet everything we are in order to follow you. But we need to be saying, yeah, yeah, Lord, but what are you asking me to risk? God, what, what, are you, what are you wanting me to bet my life on in order to follow you? Lord, I hear you that we're all to have a risky faith, but what are you asking me to risk in my personal life? What's the specific word you have for me in this generalized word? Because Lord, I, I wanna know where you want me to go. I, I wanna know what you want me to do. I, I wanna know that you're telling me to come. So Lord, give me a specific word. How do I display a risky faith in my everyday, day-to-day life? How do I risk my life to follow you? That's what each of us should be, should be doing with these general words, not just coming in like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, it was a good word, whatever, yeah, cool. No, no, God, 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 what did you have for me in that? Specifically for me to change my life, to conform me into your image and into your likeness. And listen to me, that's risky in and of itself. Because you know what? You may not like the response you get. You may not like what he's asking you to risk. But he wants you to ask him. So that he can pull you closer to him. So that you can experience the supernatural things of God for yourself. There's a lot of people experiencing it. So if we're not, it's because we're not desiring it. Hear me, hear me. If we're not experiencing the supernatural move of God right now in our lives and in our family's life, it's because we're not seeking. Because God is so near right now. He's so near. And the Bible says, seek him while he's near. Seek him while he may be found. People are getting filled with the Holy Ghost, healed, set free every single week, every week, multiple ones a week. We got a list of dates for deliverances of people getting set free. Now you got a schedule 
to get delivered because people are seeing the supernatural move of God that's taking place right amongst us. And so if we're not experiencing it, it's because we're not asking for it. Because what God will do for one, he'll do for another. Hear me. What God will do for one, he'll do for another if we're willing to risk it all. But it's risky because we may not like the response. But church, this is a a risky faith. It's a risky faith. Hear me, listen, prayer is risky. Prayer is risky. It's really risky. Because if if we're asking God to, to help us be risky and he tells us to go pray for someone at the gas station, that's risky. Because they may look at you and say, I don't want you to pray for me. Get away from me. I promise you, I've had it happen. I don't want you. Who are you? Get away from me. I felt like the Lord wanted me to pray for you. Cool. Whatever. I don't have to. But, but you know what? You also might be the answer to prayer for them. And when you walk up to them and say, hey, man, God asked me to pray for you. They break down and start bawling. I've had that happen. Oh, my gosh. I was just telling God today in the shower. God, show me you're real. And I'll give my life to you. And their life was transformed. And they gave their life to Jesus right in that moment. Listen, prayer is risky. To go and pray for someone to get healed is risky. Because what if they don't get healed? Then what? What if nothing happens when you pray? Then what? These are the, the thoughts that run through our minds. But, but what if, what if, what if? Let me, let me tell you something. It's risky, but, but hear me. If you never take the risk to pray for someone's healing, they'll never get healed. They'll never get healed. Hear me. They'll never get healed. Did I know that Paisley was gonna get healed when I told Zach to bring her in? Nope, but I believe God. God, I know you can heal her. All these doctors might not be able to, but you can. I didn't know, but I believe God. No one will ever get healed if we don't pray for their healing. So what if it doesn't happen the first time? We keep believing, we keep praying, we keep risking it. Evangelism is risky, hear me, super risky. Because what if you walk up to someone and tell them how Jesus loves them and how he desires to have a relationship with them and they laugh in your face? I've had it happen to me. I've had it happen. So what? Because let me tell you what's worse is not ministering to someone about the saving power of Jesus Christ and then never getting to experience and witness someone else's experiencing the saving power of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely amazing to watch people go from lost to found. All because we're willing to take a risk and go tell someone about Jesus. See, it's a risky faith, church. It's a risky faith. But it's a risk that we're required to make. A bet that we're required to make on God's word. And so, man, the the question you have to ask today is, will you ask God what he wants you to risk? Will you ask God for the specific word? of what you can bet your life on in order to show him that you have a risky faith for him. Who he desires you to pray for, who he desires you to minister to. Because maybe it's your grandfather and you're the only person to ever see your grandfather. And if you don't minister to him, he's going to hell. Then what? Then what? Will you be willing to risk, risk it all to tell him about Jesus? It's a risky faith, but it's, a, it's worth the risk. It's worth experiencing the supernatural things of God. And we can, if we just simply ask and seek, we will find him. Amen. Come on and stand to your feet. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Yeah, Father. Lord, I pray right now by the Spirit that this word will be planted in our hearts, Lord. That your spirit would soften our hearts to receive this word. I pray that your spirit would encourage us and quicken us to ask you for a specific word, to be willing to lay it all down, to bet everything in order to follow you. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people who say, man, I I wanna wanna live this risky faith Because if we don't live a risky faith, we'll miss out on an incredible journey with you, Jesus. A supernatural journey with you, oh God. I pray, Lord, that you would quicken our hearts. Cause us to desire 
So I'm gonna risk it all for you. Lord, I thank you for each individual here today. Lord, I thank you that our kids are up here today in big church. And I pray, Lord, that right now you would begin to touch them and strengthen them, impart to them the spirit that would cause them to risk everything, even at a young age, to follow you and to know you. I pray that, Lord. Man, set a fire inside of these kids' bones, Lord. A fire to want to follow you in a real way, a tangible way, an extraordinary way, a supernatural way. Impart that to them, I pray. Lord, I speak your protection and your blessing over each and every person within the sound of my voice right now. Holy Spirit, let them feel you in a brand new way. And Lord, help us, encourage us, strengthen us to, Lord, desire, to desire change, to look more like you today than ever before. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're gonna multiply it in our hearts, Lord. And I pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Church, we love you. We bless you. Have a great day. Practice risky faith this week. Amen.